Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. Today's topic is to explain why I am pro-military, which is curious for someone who's described himself in the past as sort of a largely libertarian, curious position to hold. So this is video number 29, and I have uh, put this into my little file of controversial issues because gee whiz, this is going to generate some controversy and hopefully clicks and hopefully comments and debate and then views and then ad revenue and then money, 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 money. I don't care what I'm saying on this channel. I just want money. So if I have to say really terrible stuff I don't even agree with, you You guys know I already sold out. But fortunately or not, this is not one of those things. This, I actually believe, like everything else I say on this channel. So we are going to talk about six things today. First, what the good guys of the world are like. Second, what the bad guys of the world are like how to deal with bad guys, the game theory of conflict, future developments, and then what we can do for the time being. So first, a very open-ended analysis of the global, I would say geopolitical, kind of global military situation. And I'm going to be saying some stuff here that I think some people will find controversial. Uh, I find it not controversial and I find it to be true, which is why I'm saying it. I'll say another thing before I start the, the talk is I think we have been slanted in the direction, at least somewhat, some people have been slanted in the direction of granting a lot of nuance to all sorts of topics that should seem pretty open and shut, which I think on, on average is a good thing. It's very good to be nuanced. But sometimes it is possible to be so nuanced that plain truths are uh, missed. Uh, or relatively simple things are missed and made to seem kind of inordinately more complex. And then when you get folks to espouse their policy agendas or policy preferences or goals, they go, well, you know, it's complicated. Where in some cases, it was in all cases, it's complicated. But in some cases, the right or wrong move is actually a bit more simple and straightforward than some people would make it out to be. And this is, I think, one of these general topics where I think the, the situation isn't actually as complex um, or as indeterminate as to who is in the right or who's in the wrong, as many people would have us believe. So to this point, I think there are good guys in this world. Um, by that, I mean uh, folks in this world, uh, countries and people who live them and their leadership that have generally very good intentions. These intentions include freedom and prosperity for all, uh, no matter their race, religion, sex, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the typified stance of the modern world, which I consider the modern West and a huge fraction of Asia. For example, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Spain, the Netherlands, Finland, Ireland, the United States, Australia. I'm just going on a worldwide sample tour. Um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and the list goes on and on for quite some time, these are places in which generally people are free to do what they want. They're, nobody cares about what race or religion or sex you are, generally. And it's a good place to be. Now, these are not 100% good places. There is no such thing. We live in the real world. It's all relative. These places definitely have flaws and definitely have injustices, the United States being no exception, of course. But these places generally have what I would consider at least four good dependable upsides on average to them, which makes them the good guys of the world, which makes constructing our moral calculus for warfare a bit more simple than it could otherwise be. The philosophies in these countries are generally good. If you go and read like the Netherlands Declaration of whatever the hell that establishes how their country functions, there's generally a lot of really nice things that are said. Like they really do want everyone to be relatively free and relatively prosperous and leave each other the hell alone and live as one. Awesome. Almost all the modern countries have just been basically almost cut and pasted constitutional frameworks that say more or less the same nice stuff. Now, it's not enough to say the nice stuff because all sorts of crazy ass communist countries say the greatest things in their constitutions, except in reality, it's hell. So part two here is hugely important. The living conditions in these places and how they treat other people are generally very good. First, the places themselves are very good. In the United States, it's a great place to be. Canada is a great place to be. And you move to Australia, you're not like, what is this dystopian hellscape? It's a great place to be. Is it the greatest possible place? Of course not. Is it better compared to the average country of the world? 
the average country of the world looks probably something in form and function like India? Yeah, by a long shot. It's a place you want to be. And here's another really cool thing. These countries generally even try to fight wars with restraint and rules. As a matter of fact, the Geneva Convention, which was well, invented whole cloth by these kinds of modern nations, the free, peaceful, loving peoples of the world, they even try to establish a very strict adherence to a set of principles about how to fight wars even against your enemy, which in generally large historical sense is almost unheard of. Like the enemy is the enemy. Kill them all and take whatever they have and you do the R word to all their women and, and all this other crazy stuff. Modern militaries from these nations fight with a crap load of restrictions. Um, Israel, the United States, Canada, Britain, when they get fired upon, they are allowed to return fire in most cases. But usually they're not allowed to start firefights with people in, in many of these confrontations. There's this whole uh, list of procedures, authorizations to go hot, all this other crazy stuff. Um, if there's unarmed people, if someone's not brandishing a weapon, you're not allowed to shoot at them. Crazy stuff that would just never occur to any of the more despotic countries of the world because like the enemy is the enemy. That guy's not supposed to be here. Bang, shoot him. So even the way folks fight wars all the way down to how they treat prisoners in these countries is just better. If you're going to fight a war against anyone, you want to fight again a, a war against them because they'll beat you in a way that is going to be the least likely to be over the top, totally uncivilized. In addition – these countries generally get better over time. In these countries, we see wealth increasing all the time. We see general freedoms going up all the time. We see their international cooperation levels go up all the time. And generally, corruption tends to, a little piecemeal, but tends to fall over time in these places. South Korea today is better than South Korea was in the 90s, way better than it was in the 70s. And in 2040, it's going to be a magic paradise place. North Korea was hell in the 70s, hell in the 90s, and literal hell today. Seemingly no improvement, possibly a backsliding, in fact. So these are places that get better over time. And almost all of these places have a free press. And that means that they're very, very transparent. If something's happening in the U.S. political establishment, you're probably going to find out about it. If something happens in Sweden's parliament, you're probably going to find out about it. That's not a lot of – other than military secrets – uh, black projects and stuff, there's just not a lot of keeping secrets in these countries. Notice I said not a lot. It doesn't mean zero. Of course, our governments will be up to no good, very secret things, blah, blah, blah. Some journalist stuff, blackmail, blah, blah, that still happens, but at rates that are vanishingly small compared to other countries, which I'll talk about as examples in a sec. So generally, great philosophies on life, actually amazing living conditions, even down to how they fight wars against other countries and deal with other countries, mostly just opening up free trade. Uh, you know, if the Netherlands comes to your shores, they're going to offer you some good stuff. They're not like, where you're like, kill you all. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, they're getting better with time and they are very transparent about their actions. So we can actually see like, are these really good places? Yes, they have a free press. The free press there is very heavily incentivized to look into whether or not there are abuses and they generally find very few. Now, so those are the good guys of the world. And that's a large fraction of the world. There's another fraction of the world that's also unfortunately quite large, which I would term the bad guys. Now, I know we're bifurcating down a straight line here. That hot, that's not how reality works. But there's a bit of a bimodality to this distribution, or at the very least, there's a section of the – even if it's a normal distribution, it's probably not um, – that's better and a section that's distinctly worse. So now talk, time to talk about that distinctly worse section. Some folks in this world, countries and people, have actually very bad intentions, for real, for real. I can give you three examples, and I'll be going into a little bit of depth here just to illustrate this sort of thing, because a lot of times what we get from other political commentators, particularly sort of uh, patriotic, pro-West kind of people, is like, these are bad places. They only know why. They just feel like red, white, and blue is colors that make them get their dicks really hard, and they're just like, America. And they're like, why? Why do you like America? And they're like, freedom. And they're like, what, what, which law do you think is the best that promotes the best freedom? And they're like, I don't know, man. They're like, oh, sweet. You don't know anything. So this is not one of those things. We know some things. I'll get right, get right to the country of my birth, Russia. First, they want a global empire. They're not secretive about this. This is common publication. Their current empire, Russia, by the way, is an empire, um, is extractive and exploitative in the way that leftists accuse the United States of being in movies and in media. So like Rage Against the Machine has like actually an album called Evil Empire where it's like, that's America. It's like, yes, yes, but is America really that evil? What are they trying to do around the world 
and you look into each case and you're like, ah, generally they kind of suck at shit sometimes, but generally they're trying to do good. Whereas in Russia, the Russian empire is a real empire. By the way, most Russians aren't white people. They're some kind of sort of half Asian looking motherfuckers. And they're generally living completely oppressed, politically unrepresented. It's like some Star Wars empire type of shit. Like the Russian government comes in and establishes some oil and gas refineries, extracts all that shit out, throws a middle finger up to the local people and fucks off. Like there's not a lot of wealth to be spread around because it's exploitative and extractive in a way that if you actually describe the literal political situation, economic situation inside Russia to some, some like leftist Hollywood person who is writing a plot, he'd be like, this is kind of cheesy. He'd be like, what do you mean? Like, Oh, come on. This is like you ripped off Star Wars. He'd be like, this is real. He'd be like, what the, f really? But yeah, you don't have to make up that America's, uh, every, almost every movie uh, in this regard is like America or some advanced Western economy is like, ah, oh, they're the real villains. Like, wow, holy shit, big brain moment. But in reality, we don't need to really make stuff up. We just roll right to Russia. And they're doing all the bad stuff. Don't worry, the bad stuff continues. Russians, on average, and not all people, but I would say a huge fraction, are really, really racist, actually racist. Uh, not the social justice warrior definition, for real, for real. I would tell you what a large fraction of Russians call black people, but I'm not going to say it because YouTube will can us for that shit. I can't even tell you what the translation is because YouTube will can us for that shit. I'll put it to you this way. It's it, when the French get really nasty with their, uh, with their football, their soccer insults, they call black players this. It's common parlance. Most Russians don't even consider it controversial. Um, in Russia, journalists are killed regularly by the government, and there is no free press. It just doesn't exist. Journalists die all the time. They just like mysteriously decide to end their own life, jumping, jumping off of a five-story hotel building into a pool which hasn't been filled with water, uh, typ typical kind of stuff. Um, don't worry, Russia doesn't uh, just keep to themselves. They try to actively subvert U.S. and other foreign free elections. So they're trying to subvert the free election process. The United States has done that before in various places, but generally stopped. Uh, they do a couple things every now and again that are icky. For Russia, this is not controversial. This is just a matter of course. That's what they do, right? Um, generally, the U.S. tries to encourage free elections around the world nowadays. Uh, for the most part, uh, Russia tries to actively discourage them and subvert them. So it looks free, and then it's not free. Uh, they engage in constant propaganda against the United States and every other country, all the time. And, and R Russia sucks so bad, you think they would be focusing on making their own country better, but they're not. They're focusing a huge fraction of their efforts on their global positioning. It's it's kind of like um, uh, a person who spends all their money on expensive jewelry and a car, but he can barely pay rent and his like dishwasher's filled to the brim and is like flies at home and he sleeps on a mattress. And you're like, man, Ron's got it all figured out. Like, no, he doesn't. You ever been to his house? You'd be like, oh, that sucks. Why is he fronting all the time? This is cool who Ron is. He wants to make sure that his social position is seen as a certain thing, his status is seen as a certain thing, but the reality the underlying conditions is that they suck. And to that end, the wealth of Russia per capita, per citizen, is embarrassingly low. But it's more embarrassing if you adjust it for IQ, because some countries on average just don't have very high IQs. So when you have a country that the average person is just not that smart, you don't really expect them to do that well economically, and generally they don't. But some countries with relatively low IQs, they have such great economic systems that they do a lot. They bat way, way. Or Scott, the video guy, would be like, what is that? Uh, hitting under par? That's good in golf? Correct. Correct. Yeah, they hit way under par for what you would think. Russia's the complete opposite. Russia has actually a phenomenally well-educated workforce. The average IQ in Russia is a little, a little bit typically at or a little bit higher than that of the United States. And their GDP per capita is just, just awful, terrible. By the way, all the natural resources you could want, they just dog shit and run in their economy because they run it as a kleptocracy. It's Vladimir Putin's personal economy to run in a dilapidated way. Don't worry. Vladimir Putin's not that smart. There's no 4D chess being played. He's just some fucking asshole who runs a country like shit. And like he has billions, but the rest of his people just aren't doing that well, not nearly as well as they could be. But don't worry, Russia is not the only country we'll talk about. Then there's China. Uh, uncontroversial statement. You can feel free to Google this if you like. Um, the Chinese consider the Han Chinese majority to be the superior race above all, uh, beyond just ethnic pride. Like, it's cool. Like, you're white, you're black, you think black people and white people are great. Dope. I love it. There's nothing wrong with racial pride. But they think that they are the superior race and other people are directly inferior to them. They're also not very shy about saying this if you look at the right sources. Um, 
they consider most of the rest of the world as some combination of black devils, that's what they call black people, and white devils, that's what they call everyone else. And if you ever want to look into what Chinese people think of other Asians, don't Google that at work because it's really insane. So they're not very nice people on average. Now, the average Chinese human being could give a flying fuck about every other race, but the official government philosophy is one of Han Chinese ethnic racial global superiority. It's like, I don't know, call me crazy, but it sounds like fucking Nazis back in the 40s. Ah, it sounds like nothing you really want to get into, but right, why not? Let's, let's keep going. They want global domination outright. They want China to be in charge of everything. Explicit. This is not a secret. They have no regard for civil rights. Civil rights are a myth in China. Uh, there is no due process. If somebody from the government wants you gone, you're gone. This happens to their TikTok stars and their fucking billionaires. They just disappear. This is not something that happens in the United States in the modern free world. It just doesn't. Okay, It absolutely happens in China regularly. And everyone knows. So everyone more or less shuts the fuck up about it. They currently, right now, and this is a real fun one. I'll tee off on this for a second. Um, after the BLM shit went down in America, you had a lot of people coming out and saying, like, look, like our country's built on a legacy of slavery. We got to attest to that. We got to atone for it. You got to apologize. And like, I had a lot of time for all that. Obviously, there's extremes to it. There's totally insane. None of us were alive for that shit. Um, uh, but nonetheless, like, yes, okay, it's real. Like some bad shit happened in history, bro. And like some people today, like some black Americans might not be as advantaged as they could be because of shit that happened historically dope. Like that, that's definitely a real thing. And SJWs and white Karens get really huffy and puffy about that. And maybe as well they should, right? And maybe they express themselves more logically, cut off all the bullshit. But yes, the thrust of the matter is like, look, inequity is really bad. Slavery is really terrible. Um, you guys, where are those people messaging the U.S. consulate and State Department to change our relations with China? So China currently operates slave labor camps right now. Right now, what you what you doing? You guys watching the video? You walking on the treadmill, watching Doctor Mike? There are people in slavery for real in China right now. What the fuck? We, we deal with that shit? Could you imagine? You, you eat a time machine, and you and you get the entire U.S. military with you through the time machine, and you go back to like the slave trade and like fucking 1700 fucking black people and Africans and fucking ships rotting away in that fucking journey. Wouldn't you stop them? Wouldn't you be like, yo, we're from the future. Slavery's done right now. It ends right now. Of course you fucking would. We got an opportunity to do that in China right now, but we don't. Why? Most people don't know about it. And the rest of the people do this, like I said earlier, pretend nuance. They're like, well, it's complicated. How many people do you, you guys think did that back in the fucking 1800s? And you were like, hey, dude, you know, like there's a third of Americans that are enslaved. They just happen to have like a different race. Seem like pretty cool people. Why, why are they in chains? You'd be like, well, it's complicated. Is it? Is it complicated? Maybe. I sure, I sure should want to hear about how Chinese slave labor is complicated. It's not, by the way. Um, there is no free press in China. The media is insanely heavily curated down to there's websites you can't get without a VPN and operating a VPN in China is a crime. So that's fun. And they are currently expanding their military to project power at a high rate. They are constantly par posturing regarding Taiwan with zero logic. There is zero good reason to take over Taiwan militarily if you are China. It's about the same reason as the U.S. would invade Canada. Really, because that's enough. Enough of Canada being free. They're the same people as us. They speak the same language. They have the same history. Random line on a map. We want Canada. But we already have Canada. We have a free trade agreement with them. Like, they're already part of America, and America's part of Canada. You just, I can drive across the border, and you're there. You can work. It doesn't matter. So with Taiwan and China, there is no compelling reason at all for unification. We know that. We've known that for a long time. But unification is something they hold up in the government to get their people aligned to see something and unite them through the process of semi-war so they don't have to pay attention to like, oh, China actually sucks and we should revolt and end this stupid fucking communist regime. So the, the Taiwan thing is insane. And hilariously and insanely insultingly to China, the semi-communist nature of their of their economic apparatus just doesn't work very well. And so you end up having this thing where China's really butthurt about Taiwan, but Taiwan is better than China at everything China does. So much so that the per capita income, the per person income of Taiwan is three times higher than that of China. It would be much more logical for the government in Beijing to be like, hey, Taiwan. They'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, can you come in and run our country for us? Like, really? Like, yeah, just run our country, man. 
We don't, we can't, just, clearly we're just not good. Like if you knew someone in basketball who isn't an opposing team, who's putting up three times the number of points you were per game, would you want to get them on your basketball team and tell them what to do? Or would you want to be like, can I join your team? You clearly know things. So the Taiwan shit is backwards, completely fucking backwards. Lastly, bad guy number three. This is not an inclusive list, just a sample of like, there are real threats in this world. People you don't want taking over is what I'll say. Last example, number three, Islamic extremists, okay? Do not mean all Muslim people, that's insane, but some people have an extreme interpretation of the faith and they do really crazy shit about it, constantly. So first, they live all over the world. They even live in the United States and the United Kingdom and all those other countries, Indonesia, et cetera. They regularly kill civilians. So uh, China, real bad place. Russia, real bad place. They almost never come for civilians. They try to fight the military if they're fighting. Uh, you know, they don't care about killing civilians, but they're not exactly the number one target. Like, even in this completely unjust, super insane war in Ukraine, which Russia evaded, invaded, yeah, they had Bucha, they had a couple things, but they were never really great trying to kill as many Ukrainian civilians as possible. They were trying to take over Ukraine, and thus they had to fight the military, and they keep, obviously, they destroy all the cities they're in, but they're destroying the cities as a part of just a real shit doctrine of just putting a crap ton of artillery down and everything and just scorched earth the shit. They're not trying to kill regular people. Islamic extremists are trying to kill regular people. They prefer it. They do very little fighting of militaries because they're not very good at fighting and they'll lose. So they just try to fight civilians instead. It's like you need someone to bully and there's like a 250 pound man standing over there. And then you look over and there's like a 10 year old kid and you're like, you little bitch. And you just hit the 10 year old kid. That's essentially what they're doing. Now, very clearly, according to them, according to most prominent scholars of the faith, their interpretation of the faith, Islamic, Islamic extremists, is that all non-Muslims roughly must either be converted, subjugated into an inferior class like we had during the Ottoman Empire, enslaved, or killed. That's it. The ability to live free with your own religion around Islamic extremists, around regular Muslims, dope, no problem. Around Islamic extremists, it's just not a thing. That's just not what they have in the cards for you. So, they, if they take over the world or whatever part of the world they take over, freedom completely goes away because it's just not on their agenda. There's more. They use people of their own faith and ethnicity as human shields regularly. It's difficult to describe a more evil people than that, but this starts to be like caricature. The Nazis didn't do that. These are like zombie Nazis or some shit like that. By the way, politically, they are as conservative as it gets, hyper-conservative, which is really funny to watch leftists just sort of defend Islamic extremists. Be like, you guys, they, they disagree with you about everything. You into gay rights? They hate that. Well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about more of their views. Their proclivity to our word, sexually assault, uh, a lot of the women that they see regularly in their world is insanely high. They do it all the time. The members of ISIS used to brag about how many women they are worded constantly. They were just everyone. These are Iraqi Muslim girls they were doing this to, by the way. Like, I don't understand, but I can rejigger the mental architecture to be like, okay, we're in a foreign land. These are foreign peoples. We're dehumanizing them. Why not get a little R word going? Yeah, hell yeah, fellas, it's all good. Just a matter of warfare. That's how dad did it. That's how grandpa did it. You do your own people like that, it starts to make very little sense, right? They hate Jews, which is like, okay, fine, get in line. Everyone fucking hates Jews. But don't worry. They hate everyone else too. There's not anyone they don't hate. They just hate a lot. Gay people, they kill gays regularly. It's illegal to be gay. It's immoral to be gay. They'll just throw you off a rooftop. Trans, you can forget about that shit anytime. Don't even bother bringing that shit up to them. Trans people aren't human by a long shot. Christian, they want to convert you, subjugate you, enslave you, or kill you. So there's no room for you both. Countries which are Islamist, not the same thing as Islamic. Turkey's an Islamic country and they're doing just fine. An Islamist country, mm, closer to something like Iran, for example. Uh, they have no free press, very little personal freedom. Oh, by the way, dog shit standards of living. You don't want to live in Iran. It's a shit place to live. Most very Islamist countries are real shit places to live. Nobody's moving into Yemen anytime soon is what I'm trying to say. If they take over or where they take over, it's bad news. I don't mean modern bad news. I mean bad news from ages ago. We're talking about a people's, Islamic extremists to be very specific, that have... Gee, man, 
Dark Ages understandings of the world and Dark Ages intentions. We're talking about shit that you just don't even see anymore, normal people doing. The kinds of torture, the kinds of uh, sexual assault, the kinds of indiscriminate or very discriminate killing, genocide, no problem. That's par for the course for these people. That's what they want. And it's not some kind of confusion where it's like, well, Dr. Mike really is just a corporate like fucking – conservative agenda you're spitting out. In reality, it's the leftist politics of an insufficient amount of water or economic resources or the fact that Western people are in their lands. They have pride. It's a reaction to colonialism. Every single one of those has been examined and every single one of those has failed to meet muster of a comprehensive holistic explanatory uh, uh, structure. This doesn't explain anything, uh, not nearly as much as we'd want. And it turns out that when the folks really tell you, they're like, yes, hello, I'm a member of an insane cult and I want everyone to die, et cetera. And this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. And you look at their record, you're like, they're doing exactly what they're saying. You don't seem to be lying about it. So we don't actually have to go and find austere explanations for why they really do something. Uh, they're very, very upfront about why they do it. And it's just not controversial. Now, very, very big deal point. It's easy to think that these folks, not so nice peoples of the world, that's just for now, you know, at least the Russians, Chinese, and Islamic extremists, but there are many others. It's easy to think that these folks want the best for everyone, but they just have a different perspective on how to get it. And I really, really wish that was the case. And I think a lot of people, especially from the political left, want to believe that. And I understand why they do. I mean, like, I want to believe that every conflict between humans is just a misunderstanding. Like we're all trying to get to the same really good place. We all want the same good things for everyone. We just have differences about how maybe a little bit of difference about where we're going, but not ton. And maybe very big differences about how we're going to get there. And that's how wars start and stuff like that. I wish this was true, but uh, this would be wrong if we thought that was the case. If these folks wanted the best of things, um, the the policies um, – to get there have been kind of undisputed doctrine for generations now, specifically economic and social liberalization. There is not a country in the world which is a good place to live that doesn't have a very high degree of economic and social liberty. That's just how you get good things. That's what mean, makes South Korea different from North Korea, Taiwan different from China, and so on down the line. If Russia, for example, very, very good uh, example here, China, Russia and China do not have political opposition internally in any real sense. And that actually affords them the ability to do something that's only been done a few times. And that's when a dictatorial power, a singleton power, actually executes proper changes that make a country better off. This has happened at least once in Singapore. Singapore, and one Chinese motherfucker in charge, and he was like, we're going to do this right from day one. And they did. And Singapore's fucking paradise, a couple weird laws here and there, not so libertine. But outside of that, it's just a miracle, like economic growth all the time, generally huge degrees of social freedom, immigration, all that stuff. Everything's great. Russia and China have the political apparatus to do this. As a matter of fact, China sort of did this in the 1990s when Deng Xiaoping woke up and they were like, oh, communism really sucks. And they're like, all right, want to get richer? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's set up some free trade zones, uh, decrease the tariffs on goods, open up our economy. They did. And that's what rocketed China into the 2000s when people said, like, dude, China's going to be the place. In 2030, man, forget about America. China's going to be the place. Unfortunately, China regressed back to, drumroll, stupid, old, tired communist bullshit. Xi Jinping, as Xi Jinping thought, which is like, comical. It's, it's a level of political ideology you would expect from, like, a freshman in high school in the United States. Embarrassing. Vladimir Putin, he's the only person in charge in Russia. What he could have done if I was Vladimir Putin and I was an evil scumbag and my only thing that I wanted was to get frivolously rich, what I would do is I would use the economy for my own benefit. But how would I do that? Well, you see, I'm just some guy on YouTube who doesn't even have a degree in this, but I've read enough economics literature, you know, any economics literature, to where I understand that if you liberalize the economy, put a flat tax, relatively low tax on it, and just gas the thing into the moon, which is really all it takes, build a decent infrastructure, which Russia has absolutely the ability to do, liberalize the economy like crazy, international trade um, super loud, internal trade super loud, a very uh, well-built banking system. And after that, you just start counting the money. And I would just, if I was Vladimir Putin, I'd be like, free the shit up, give me 20 years of fucking growth, and I'm just going to take 1% of this shit. And after a while, they'd be like, I don't know, like a trillion dollars or some shit like that. You'd still be the richest person of all time by a mile, but you could, if you want to gas something up and benefit from it, 
Don't you want it to go well? It's like if you have a cow and you're going to eat the fucking cow, like the cow's interests are not in mind. Don't you want to eat a big fat fucking cow, 2,000 pound fucking heifer? Don't you want to do that? Or do you want to eat some kind of starving cow with ribs poking out who dies of old age? You're like, fuck, is that even safe to eat? So these folks in charge in China and Russia, if they were really smart, if they really wanted good things for their people, they could have just engineered their economies to be Singapore-like, which has, by the way, no political freedom, and they would have still been in charge and been fabulously wealthy and actually have something to be proud of because Russia and China are real proud. Oh, Russia and China, but you go there and it fucking sucks. You can't even drink the water in China. What kind of pride is that? They aren't doing a good job even with their own countries because drum roll, they don't actually know what they're doing. They just suck. Unfortunately, it's just not that hard to believe. Some folks just want totalitarianism or they want kleptocracy, and that's what they get. The thing is, this isn't so surprising because most of the world's governments, dare I say almost all of them, up until about 300 years ago, were literally like feudal kleptocracies. You just had like a fucking royal monarch in charge. They just did whatever the hell they wanted. The country's kind of blue dick, and that's what it was. Only about a couple hundred years ago, did rights-based democracies like the United States and France, the United Kingdom, really start to grow? And right now, they're only maybe halfway spread around the world. So the other half of the world doesn't do civil rights. Sure, shit, don't do democracy. And so the battle there isn't over yet. And look, I'm not some kind of pro-democracy person. I think democracy is meh. Um, I'm not a huge fan of masses of completely idiotic people choosing advanced policies, but it sure shit beats the alternative of one dude being in charge and just well, doing the country dirty all the time. So forget about even democracies. It's the rights-based stuff that I want. Constitutional republic. That's the thing that works really well to produce a crap load of freedom and a crap load of wealth and generally make for very good neighbors. But Belgium's not trying to invade any of its neighbors anytime soon. Can't say the same shit about China. Sure, shit can't say the same thing about Russia. Rights-based democracies, rights-based constitutional republics are just better. And if you have to ask at what, the answer is everything. They're better at everything. What's better in Russia than somewhere else in the world? Nothing. I don't know. They have Matryoshka dolls. They're fine, but they're probably made better somewhere else, even than in Russia. <sighs> so we got good guys-ish. We got bad guys-ish. But at the very extremes, there's some very, very good guys and some very, very bad guys. How do you deal with bad guys? You always start with diplomacy. The first thing you do is diplomacy because war really sucks and killing's really terrible. It's super expensive. It's super unfortunate. The first thing you do is you try diplomacy. The second thing you do is try diplomacy. The ninth thing you do is try diplomacy. And many people of the world can be reasoned with. How do we know that? Well, the advanced modern economies to each other, Taiwan to South Korea, France to the United States, all they do is diplomacy. They haven't fought each other in generations. And it works. There's a bit like France wants this, the US wants that, we hash it out, we get a trade deal, that's it. It's, it's, it's great. Diplomacy is awesome. It's by far the best thing. But some countries don't really understand diplomacy much. They only understand the game theoretics of if you fuck with me, you're going to lose really badly. And it's like someone who is kind of acting a fool at a party or at a hangout just some kind of cocky young motherfucker. And he's going to be a dick to everyone until someone shows up that's two times more Jack than is wearing their black belt. And then all of a sudden they're respectful as fuck because they know they're going to get that ass beat. Some people in some countries reason at this level. And unfortunately, some of these folks will interpret the nine attempts at diplomacy before the 10th attempt at warfare from more ethical countries. They'll interpret this as weakness straight up. Like China, Russia, et cetera, they think the West, the United States, et cetera, is weak because they always try to like avoid war. What they maybe know, and some of the people there know, some of the people are delusional enough to not know, is that in a direct confrontation, they would lose 99 times out of 100 very, very badly. But they're not reminded of this often enough, so they act a fool all the fucking time with no backstop. And sometimes these folks forget the game theory and they just attack. And the tenth step in game theory, if you're on the side of the good countries, is to be able to win if those other countries attack. So just to recapitulate, the best way to deal with not so nice folks in the world is diplomacy. But you have to have a backstop if they choose no diplomacy or if diplomacy fails. If that country attacks or gets really nasty militarily, you have to have a backstop. And that backstop has to be being able to win when they attack. And not just win, not just win. We need to be able to crush 
those militaries and make the war as fast as possible with as small amount of collateral damage as possible. Why? Why not have a good old slugfest with two near peers like World War II, where it takes fucking six years to hash the thing out and half of Europe is destroyed? Oh, I kind of made my point already. Couple reasons. Overwhelming force is the best possible deterrent. People get into wars because they assess there's a probability of victory. If you genuinely assess the probability of victory to be incredibly slim, you just generally stop going to war or you're much less likely to do it. You might get pissy at the grocery store if some little young law TikToker cuts in front of line. But if a 380 pound dude with traps up to his ears cuts in line, you might just might not say anything because you're like, uh, where is this going to go? He's going to overwhelmingly tear my limbs apart. I don't want any part of this. You, nobody wants to lose wars badly. Nobody wants to fight wars in which you don't even get the honor of seeing your enemy. If you're talking about Saddam Hussein and the Gulf War, most of that fighting was just getting bombed every night and having no idea where the fuck the shit was coming from. You can't even see the airplanes that come at night and a bunch of them are stealth and it's just like, oh, we're just getting beat down. It's not a war anyone's having fun with because, you know, there's this idea, especially in all those countries, the gloriousness of war, like to battle. And they raise the rapier and the troops are advancing through the snow and you get a nice little painting out of it and Mao Zedong is standing on top of an armor personnel carrier pointing towards the stars, shit like that. We don't want that kind of war for them. We want a war in which it's embarrassing. A war in which there is no chance of victory. There are no heroes. There are no fond memories. Ask the Iraqis how many fond memories they had of the Gulf War. They're going to be like, a lot of shit just blew up. And then they stopped. And then we just didn't have Saddam Hussein around anymore or whatever. He was still around, but he shut the fuck up for a long time. So we want overwhelming force because overwhelming force is the best possible deterrent. Because if you think you can beat a country, that's kind of inviting war in some sense. Now, Obviously, it doesn't invite war for the non-warlike. Belgium might be able to beat Luxembourg in a war. They don't care because they're way too mature. They have realized cooperation is 50 times better than conflict, but not all peoples of the world have realized that. Russia hasn't realized China and the Islamists sure should haven't. So the backstop to that is, okay, you guys want to fight. It's not going to be a fair fight. It's going to be real downhill. That makes them reconsider it and keeps the probability of war down substantially. Next, we want to reduce collateral damage in wars. Collateral damage is bad for everybody. It hurts innocent people in the country. We're going to fight China. Chinese people are fucking great. I want as few of them to fucking die as possible. We don't want to nuke China and destroy like, some of the world's greatest cities and toast 50 billion people at the same time, or whatever, 50 million. Um, we want to like precision strike just the people in charge of the Communist Party so they go, listen, we're out. We're done with this war. That would be ideal. Just destroy military hardware. Even with soldiers not in it, that would be really, really awesome. And because you're not you're fighting wars that are attempting to have minimum collateral damage, you are disrupting the infrastructure as little as possible. After World War II, Germany was gone, bro. There was no Germany. They had to rebuild the whole fucking thing. Do you know how much fucking money that costs? Do you know how much money that could have been used to raise the standards of living of people rather than just bring them up to the same level? Oh my God, they, they must have toasted five or 10 years in the rebuilding process in Germany just getting back up to a standard of living from before the war. What a terrible thing. If we had less collateral damage, you could be like, oh, like, most of the shit is still where it's supposed to be. The Kosovo conflict uh, against Serbia by the NATO allies, like very little collateral damage, but they just put that air war down on these motherfuckers to the point where they were like, look, we're done. We're done. There's no destroyed freeways, blown up skyscrapers, none of that shit. You know, a couple things here and there, but very, very minimal because you just go in after the people you want and the militaries you want and just hurt the military and hurt the leadership. Very little collateral damage is better for everyone. It doesn't kill as many people and it doesn't dilapidate the country and continue to hurt people for years after. Lastly, if you have a near-peer conflict, the there's a lot of jostling, as is going in Ukraine and Russia right now, for who's really ahead and who's behind. And that jostling takes a while to figure out until, game theoretically, someone gets an unmatched advantage and wins the war. That can take a long time. Long wars suck. War is has been called by uh, at least one, uh, I think, a philosopher, economist, development in reverse if you think about it, is exactly true. Development is construction, war is destruction, and long war is just bad in all possible ways. Uh, here's what happens in war. This isn't an exaggeration, it's just a different perspective, but it may nonetheless be instructive. We build military hardware and we take really good young men, the promise of their lives, we send them somewhere and some large fraction of them just get destroyed. That's it. 
Is there anything a war creates that we really want? I don't know, some military tech, but private industry does that really well anyway. It's just a bunch of people dying. Uh, what happened with Germany versus France, England, and the United States and Russia? They just toasted like, I don't know, a third of Germany's population. For what? These are fucking Germans. They're awesome fucking people. They're just killing them. For, for why? Why? What's the productive endeavor? Long wars are terrible. War is hell. If you've ever been in war, you're like, of course, war is hell. It's not fun. It's not glorious. It just blows dick. So to that end, the game theoretically, if you happen to find yourself in the sort of Western, Eastern, modern allied powers, being able to deter war, being able to make war very quick, and on top of that, being able to do it with minimum collateral damage is best done not by having a near peer. This would be very difficult to do to China, for example, with the U.S.'s current capabilities. It's very much more likely to be able to be done when you have left everything behind. It's kind of like if you have someone acting up at a party and they're like, let's say, five foot nine and 190 pounds, pretty muscular, athletic, and you, you get another guy to confront him, be like, hey, can you go calm him down? But that guy's like 5'10 and 205 pounds and just about as athletic, maybe a little more. Man, this could be some shit, man. There could be like the, the guy who's who's starting the shit could be like, nah, man, I, fuck you, throw a punch. And then fuck that, you ruin the party, everything sucks. But if the person that comes up to that guy who's 5'9 acting a fool is Brian Shaw, 6'9", 440, world's strongest man, that, that might be like, hey, man, can you – and that's what that's one of the reasons, actually, the number one reason why bouncers are so big. Literal intimidation for drunk people. A bouncer has to come up to you when you're drunk out of your mind so that your ancestral primate physical space analysis architecture goes, eh, this opponent's too big. And like if you ever see like a really large animal, like a moose in real life, there's a part of you fucking gutturally that's like, holy shit. I'm going to get the fuck away from that thing because if it decides to have a bad time, I'm not going to be involved. Same idea with near-peer militaries. You don't want a near-peer military. You want a military that has left everybody behind so that when shit gets popping off and countries talk that shit, you go, hey, America showed up. And they're like, ah, duh. What are we going to do? Just lose? Fuck that. We're backing off. Left everyone behind. Left everyone behind in what, you ask? In weapons, in intel, in logistics, in funding, in projection, in survivability, in everything. If you have a military alliance that's just way beyond, the probability of a war starting drops precipitously. In addition to that, there's a little bit of a silver lining as well. Many bad guy countries trying to keep up with the allies militarily can just bankrupt themselves trying to do it, which is a great incentive for them to actually just get out of the compete with modern militaries game altogether. For example, if you have a cop in the United Kingdom and he's in your face about some shit you did, he's got uh, no body cam, no gun, you might talk some shit to that cop, but nobody's talking shit to the SWAT team. If the SWAT team shows up, everyone's like, up, 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 right? That's why, because fighting the SWAT team is futile and most even degenerate criminals know this. At some point, it would be really awesome if the allied powers got so much more powerful than everyone else that fighting them becomes really, really futile. This already happened in a microcosm with the uh, allies, uh, NATO, et cetera, versus the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union tried to outspend NATO, actually just the United States, in military spending successfully for a decade or so, and they just bankrupted them. They just couldn't keep up. They couldn't make a big enough military to keep up. So if you consistently, as the good guys, elevate the status of your military, you leave everyone behind to where they're like, well, we're never going to catch up to that. You better not do anything really stupid or just have a military for homeland defense. We're not going to project our power out into the world, which so we're just going to lose that fight. Let's say the Saudis, for some reason, uh, decide to get snarky and invade Kuwait. Uh, they already know how that ends. So they've already seen, like, when you fuck with the big dog, you get the hammer quick. That's what we want. The amount of peace that was encouraged in the Middle East with the 1991 uh, handling of the Saddam Hussein invasion of Kuwait was probably quite a bit. You say, well, Mike, how can you say that? The Middle East is such a shithole of war, like it's always been that, and it's probably marginally less warlike because a lot of other countries that had all sorts of ambitions, oh, I'm going to invade this and I'm going to invade that. 
they stopped because they were like, oh my God, like it's not going to be a fight when we get to it. More particularly in modern times, North Korea has not invaded South Korea for probably one reason. And that's because the Kims, who are in charge of North Korea, isn't that cool? That's like uh, the king, the, the royal family. Uh, they know it's suicide. They know that as soon as they attack South Korea, the end game is no more North Korea. And it doesn't matter how many South Koreans they take with them and how many nukes they lob out into the world to try to hurt everyone as they go down. They're going down. They know that. So they're real good about talking smack. They're real bad about doing anything about it, which is exactly what we want. We do not want a situation in which North and South, let's say South Korea has no allies and is at rough parity with North Korea. North Korea going to be invading real soon, man. They don't want South Korea there. They want to take over the whole fucking thing. But if South Korea plus allies is 10 times stronger than North Korea, they're going to put out media that's saying, oh, they're, they're the real winners and all that stuff. But they're just generally going to shut the fuck up and keep to their country like they have been for the entire existence of North Korea because it would be a real bad time for them. Because there is a superlative, categorical, massive, not near peer advantage that is a very, very pacifying thing. So my hope for future development what I think is would be a good thing. Ideally, in the long term, decades from now, the allied powers would become so overable, and they're on their way, I think they'd just be going faster, that most or all of the world just folds in and just goes, you know what, fuck that. We're not stepping out of line. Then we don't have to have crazy ass countries like China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia making the world a worse place for everyone. We just wouldn't have to have that. For example, if Ukraine was a NATO member state, Russia would have never invaded Ukraine. Why? Because NATO would crush Russia and they know that. It would crush them quickly. It would take two weeks. So they're like, that, fuck that. So they just pick on the little people on their border, Georgia and um, all sorts of other parts of the stands in Russia. They do that shit all the time because they can, because they do have a fighting chance. You want to give these people no fighting chance. So they look over, they see essentially Brian Shaw and they're like, nah, that's not going to work. Um, if you have this kind of military supremacy, the probability that uh, these countries start making the world not such a bad place goes down and uh, their people are better off for it. Other people around the world are better off for it. The Ukrainians, particularly in this case, is a good example. The environment, which these countries do terrible things to, the economy, it's just better for these places to either not exist or the country still exists, but in free, uh, uh, socially and, and economically free situations, or just that they exist, they keep to themselves, and they at the very least don't bother anyone because they know bothering anyone is going to be suicide. Now, I'm not saying that there should be one world order with one military. Absolutely not. But many nations united with the goal of competing with each other to see who provides for a better place for free peoples to live in. And that is the best kind of competition that you want. I don't care if China's stronger militarily, who's moving to China from the United States versus vice, uh, versus vice versa. If you just open up borders right now, probably about a third of China would move into the United States and like 10,000 Americans would move to China. And that would be that. And it'd be like, oh, looks like we won that one. So in the, in the end, if you liberalize the world, people just want to go to where is best. That's the best kind of competition to have between countries. And it's a really good idea to make sure that there's no like crazy asymmetries of power, that independent militaries of these countries, France, Germany, UK, et cetera, um, they still have their independent militaries, but they train with one another in the alliance. So they're always cooperating with one another instead of posturing against each other. Because at this point, hopefully, there would be no more need or much smaller need to try to prepare to fight the entire world or fight huge near peer megalith nations one against each other. That's really crazy. In this sort of end run game, there would be much less military spending because most military spending costs us for power projection for global scale war. That's like 90% of military spending. If you don't have to do that much anymore and you scale that down by, you know, a factor of five or something, you're spending less money in the military. You got more money for almost everything else. Most of that money probably would be spent then on special forces because you still have the countries of Africa, Middle East, Asia, et cetera, that are real bad places to be. And every now and again, you need to depose some leaders or put in a, a, a peacekeeping force. And that's much more special forces kind of operational stuff. Now, for the time being, 
until that future world in which there are no nefarious near peers, I think the United States, the countries of the free world, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, pretty much all of Europe, et cetera, Oceania, should aim for total military dominance capacity, which means a few things. One, keep defense spending where it is or even raise it. If you raise defense spending, China's going to burn itself out trying to keep up, and then they might just quit, or it just might become apparent they're not a near peer and they have to recalculate all their game theory. You don't want China uh, being near peer to the United States. You don't ever want to get the edge. Because remember, if they take over the world, they're probably going to kill or enslave almost all black and white people. That's most of the world, by the way. Real bad time. Real bad time. And if you don't believe me, look at how they treat their own people. They run a giant prison for their own people. Bad idea. You don't want them to win. You want to get really, really ahead of that. We want more investing in AI, military systems, in drones, in robotic warfare, more investment in energy weapons, like they're already doing all this stuff, lasers on planes and shit like that. Invest in air dominance platforms and strategies. So there's a fighter that's going to be released uh, publicly in 2025, 2024, no, 2024. Uh, next generation air dominance platform. It's really super high tech, super futuristic, replaces the F-22 Raptor, which is already the most capable fighter by a mile. And people say like, really, why are we making the NGAD? It costs like a trillion dollars. Why don't we just keep our Raptor fleet going? They're already the best. We, say, we don't want to be the best. We want to be the best, 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 best. To where if China's like, look, we're going to start some shit. Like, Sweet. We send five NGAD fighters there and we paralyze your whole country. Nobody's taken off. You don't shoot any missiles anywhere. You can't see anything. Shit just starts blowing up. That's what we want. We want high-tech systems that just nullify the shit. No more competition. And if the Chinese secret, ser or secret service, if their intelligence community know that this is a real thing, that somebody in China has a real understanding of what America would do if they wanted to flex, they'd be like, look, 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 look. Still posture about war. Still do this and that. But ain't nobody trying to get into war with America for real, man. We will lose that shit. Here's another one. This is a big deal. I happen to suspect by a small margin, I'm not assigning a huge probability of this. I wouldn't put any money on it. I think this is already a real thing. And I would. I think the, the, the incentives are massive for this. Here's my proposal. Maybe this is already a real thing. There's some good reasons to believe it's a thing. I think we want to, in the United States and other uh, modern powers, invest in near total or essentially total anti-ballistic missile technology, which means that all the intercontinental ballistic missiles North Korea has, China has, Russia has, are rendered essentially zero or very close to zero effectiveness. They render our own ICBM systems ineffective if another country had them, which actually we would be totally great with. It would be unbelievable if China had a full anti-ICBM shield, like there is nothing getting through China. If it's an intercontinental ballistic missile, it just gets shot down. That would be awesome because we don't need our ICBMs anymore to fight China. We could beat them in a conventional war. And if shit goes like I'm saying it should, we would beat them by a mile in a conventional war. Nuclear war is so fucking bad for everyone, especially the people getting nuked, but really the whole world, that if we invested a lot into anti-ballistic missile technology, at some point, it would be like, that shit's not working anymore. And I have some reason to suspect we've already done that. If you ever, um, they scrub this off Google, which I can't believe is a real thing, but apparently shit happens. There's this project called the Marauder Project in the early 90s. It was like uh, basically like a, a sort of laser-like system. It was like an ion cannon, for real. And it worked surprisingly very well. And it was it, intercepting missiles at like frightening velocities and um, it was just – it was really gnarly effective energy weapon. And then in, like in the mid-90s, it went so well. They classified it, turned into a black project. They just never hear about it again. That was the mid-90s. What's that, what's that shit now? Is it on every ship in the U.S. arsenal? I don't know. It could be. Um, so there's another thing where Russia was posturing with nuclear stuff at the beginning of the Ukraine war. And a couple of people, like very high-end uh, Anthony Blinken – um, uh, General Lloyd Austin, a couple other folks in that sphere were asked on live TV, like, what do you guys think about the Russian nuclear threat? And they were basically, one of them was like, I forgot who it was. They were like, look, I can't really say a lot about this because uh, obviously secrecy, but we're just not really worried about it. And I, I, was, I remember it was 2022 and I was like shocked to hear that. I was like, what the fuck? They're saying that out in the open? Can you imagine being Russian and hearing that? Be like, ah, nobody's really worried about your nukes. They're like, wait a minute. What is it they know that we don't? What is it they have that we don't? Well, in I believe in 2002, the U.S. pulled out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which is a treaty that's saying, look, 
Nobody's developing anti-ballistic missile technology because the game theoretics of the mutually assured destruction at the time was that if one country really gets a huge ballistic missile shield, they're incentivized to attack the other country with ballistic missiles. They'll get a return volley. Most of it will be blocked and then they'll crawl out of the rubble sooner. The whole thing is fucking insane because nobody wants to nuke anybody. But that was the situation. In 2002, the U.S. left that treaty unilaterally. No one else really said anything because they were like, well, we can't do anything about this. And 2002 is a long time ago, folks. That's 20 years. If we think about it, this might already be in the works big time. I think it should be extra, extra in the works. I think we should be getting to a place where it's public knowledge. China's got, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 intercontinental ballistic missiles. And we go, fuck that. We'll knock them all out. We don't give a fuck. If you're China and you hear that, you got to be like, oh, shit. We got nothing. And the reality is that's what we want. We don't want to have to negotiate with anyone. We don't want to have a situation where we're like people that literally own slaves. We're like, well, man, got to make sure we'll take their global, you know, global posturing into account. Fuck that. Huge ICDM shield would be fucking amazing. And lastly, I think we should invade, uh, invade, invest a considerable amount into special forces so that they can regularly kill top tiers in the leadership of global terrorist organizations. Because global terrorist organizations are about the closest thing you get in the real world to like child storybook levels of evil, like Al-Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, ISIS, Hamas. These are people who special forces groups from the modern countries in the world world should keep tabs of and occasionally just kill as many rungs of their top leadership as possible. Rope in Delta Force, they shoot everyone, pull out a couple people who might know things about who next to kill, repeat the cycle, and just do this all the time. To, to do two things. One, deliver a message to psychotic groups that what you're doing is a non-starter. You're not going to be plotting. You're not going to be scheming. You're not going to be attacking. You're just going to be dying. I want that kid who saw his 19-year-old brother get murked by Delta Force, to 15-year-old kid, to look at that AK that used to be his brother's in his room and look at him and be like, am I picking it up? And am, I, am, I, am I fighting the revolution now? And go, fuck that. Because your daddy died, your uncle died, now your brother died. They died unceremoniously in the middle of the night where guys with fucking night vision goggles came in and fucking two-tapped everybody. That's it. There's no fucking this shit. There's no throwing a fucking Molotov cocktail at an armored vehicle. None of that. They just die in the middle of the night. You get enough people understanding that's what's going to happen when you're up to no good, people just quit. Most people just have no intention of going any further than that, first of all. Second of all, the people that are the most competent and the most violent, that's not everyone in the world. Generally, terrorist organizations have success where they manage to kill a bunch of people when the people at the top of the hierarchy are some combination of the most competent and the most violent. Um, it was KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was described as a genius by most people. Uh, very violent, very smart. Uh, Osama bin Laden, similar idea. If you kill a high enough fraction of the top leadership of terrorist organizations, what you get remaining is just a bunch of confused teenagers and no one's that competent and no one's that violent because the most violent slash competent intersections, they were killed by the Navy SEALs and Delta Force regularly. After some number of years and decades of this happening, you just got different people in that part of the world. All the fucking super violent, super meticulous people, they're dead. And everyone knows that if you're one of those people and you pick up the fucking AK, you're going to die too. So I think special forces work against terrorist organizations should be something that happens all the fucking time, unapologetically, all the fucking time. You don't need approval for it. You don't need a Democratic vote for it in the fucking Senate. It's just something that happens all the time. Fuck these people. They're evil. They're coming after you and everything you love. And yes, it is actually possible to pretty much kill them all or the fraction of them all that does all the stuff. Because if you have a bunch of upset 15-year-olds somewhere in Syria with no global reach, no intel, and none of them smart enough to figure it out, you don't have a terrorist group anymore. You just have a bunch of upset 15-year-olds. If you have a bunch of upset 15-year-olds, you have a whole hierarchy above that of 20, 30, 40-year-olds, real sharp, real violent, real planning, real meticulous. They give those 15-year-olds training and give them AKs and give them bomb vests, and then they go do really bad things. You kill that top hierarchy and you fucking kill it all the time. You got no functioning or much less functioning terrorist stuff. Does this all sound really fucked up? Yes. Does it sound like I'm saying America should be the world police along with all the other free countries of the world? Absolutely. Why? Because per a few videos ago, police forces work and they absolutely fucking work on a global scale. And if you're confused about any of this, figure out if you want to live in a place like Taiwan or in a place like North Korea. If you want to live in a place like Taiwan, you got to make sure places like Taiwan, modern, free countries of the world, aren't just strong. They're not just stronger. They're the best by a mile. 
And in all of the other places of the world that are bad, full of not so great people that want to hurt you and the people you love, they look at the situation and they think twice about doing some stupid shit. Anyway, let me know if it gets you guys triggered. Comment, like, subscribe, et cetera. Peace.